You're listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is season three, episode 15, finale. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Throughout season three, we've been discussing healing through creativity. And for the finale, I've brought in two more adoptees who are absolute experts in this topic. My guests are Pamela Cordano, a psychotherapist who we've heard on some of my favorite healing episodes, and also no stranger to the podcast, Anne Heffron, the author of You Don't Look Adopted, which happens to be my favorite adoptee memoir. We discuss creativity and can we actually heal from adoption trauma or are we just building up a huge toolbox of coping strategies together? Get ready to put this episode on repeat because Pam and Anne have a fire hose of wisdom on topics I hadn't even considered before, like why healing in community means magnified healing. If you're listening when this has just been released, Anne and Pam are also going to tell you about a special event they're planning for February 2018. And even once they get into the details of the retreat, stick with us because they give some great takeaways to try out for those of us. You can just go ahead and insert that sad face emoji here from me uh, that won't be able to make it to the retreat. If you're listening after the retreat has already happened, I am almost certain there will be another one in the works. So make sure to follow their socials to get details of any upcoming events. This episode has been brought to you by my incredibly generous Patreon supporters. And so I'd like to dedicate this finale episode to you amazing people who believe in me so much that you are standing with me financially every single month. No words can explain how grateful I am for each of you. Okay, show notes, including links to all of the things we'll be talking about today are on the website adoptizon.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome back to Adoptees On, Anne Heffron. Hi, Anne. Hey, Haley. And Pamela Cordano. Welcome back, Pam. Thank you. It's so good to be here. And hi to you and hi to Anne and hi to everybody listening. I am so excited to talk to you guys because you have something big planned. And so I really want um, everyone to hear about your event that's coming up. Um, But first, let's just talk about season three. And we had this thread throughout of healing through creativity. And so I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. And if you had any big takeaways from listening to any of the episodes, thoughts about healing through creativity. Anne, why don't you start? I listen to all of them at least once, and some of them I listen to a few times. I think if I if I put them all together, there is hopefulness that that's what I took away from season three was that it's one thing to tell the your story as an adoptee, and sometimes that can be well, it's depressing a lot of the times. <laughs> But to take that story and then to make it art, I mean, Brian's, I I listened to a couple of times just to hear his voice because he was so joyful. And even when he was close to tears sometimes, there was still an energy in his voice that I was calling him vitamin B in my head because I was thinking, okay, that's, this is where the superpower of adoption comes in. When you take what you're given and you make it into something else, like if you sing or you um, create jewelry or you paint, you do needlework, there's, that's, that's the joy. I did it through writing, but I wrote about adoption so that I could have some credibility in the adoptee world because what I really wanted to do was help other people tell their stories Uh, because I, that for me is to, to watch someone go from thinking they don't have a story to tell or that their story is the same as everybody else's. So it's not worth telling to, to, to seeing in their face, them recognizing that their story not only has merit, but that it's actually really important to tell that is the very, very best thing. And so when I heard Pam on your show, I was thinking it's her. (laughs) She's 
<laughs> she's the golden ticket because she understands how the brain works. And I want to connect with her because I think it's like when you have two people at the piano, I felt like we could cover a lot of keys together and, and really tap into people, people who are really stuck and just don't have hope of how, how are they special? How are they, what, how are they going to get out of feeling trapped? Um, and, and what can they do with their life? What, what do you think, Pam? I think creativity is such a powerful topic and I'm, I'm so excited that you're focusing on it because I think of creativity as being like birth and from the wreckage of our histories or from the treasures of our lives, what, what do we want to create? What can we create that touches us and touches other people and makes an impact and creates a picture or creates a sentence where there wasn't one before? And I feel like creativity is exponential healing and offering in the sense that it, it touches so many other people and then they have it, they have a new awareness of something about what was either created or spoken or written that they didn't have before. And then like our consciousness rises around the issue of adoption. That was something I said to a few of the different guests I had on season three. Do you understand that you are literally changing the societal view of adoption through this particular work? Right. It's it's pioneer work and it's it's a gift. It's a complete gift to everybody. And it's powerful. Maybe it's the most powerful thing. When I hear about what people are doing with their pain and their stories and their strengths um, related to adoption in a direct way, I just get so inspired and strengthened when I hear about it. And it's almost like I've been in the closet as an adoptee and I've been parts of other worlds uh, related to cancer and illness and trauma and death. And I've been healing and working on my adoption, but in more um, indirect ways. And so uh, I, when I heard about this uh, six word adoption memoir project, I was just blown out of the water. And I find myself writing my own six word memoirs uh, on different days and they change, you know, <laughs> one day is different from the next. And I just love the project so much. And it just makes me so happy that it's adoptee specific. I know they're so fantastic. And I don't think I could just write one like to encapsulate everything. It's yeah, yeah, it's such a great idea. Um, so many of my guests came up with these really unique ways to express themselves creatively. And don't you find that because our trauma, so much of it is pre-verbal, it's kind of the only way they, it sounded like to me, it's the only way they knew how to get it out of themselves. Yeah, I mean, Anne, some of you main listeners may know that Anne has been on this meme kick lately, and I've been writing memes, I've been designing memes that are really, um, I think most of the world would consider them pretty blasphemous as far as what they're saying about being adopted, so I haven't really gone public with them yet, but or maybe I, I don't know if I will, but to, to put a picture together with a word or a phrase was so satisfying. I, I basically was awake for two days just doing meme after meme after meme and laughing harder than I, I've ever laughed, you know, and it, it was just so liberating. Okay, how do I get to see some of these? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'll send, them, I'll send them to you. Okay. I, yeah, they're really, I mean, they're, they're pretty risque, uh, honestly. <laughs> right, Anne? Yeah. Do you do you want to want to give us like one like your tamest one? <laughs> oh, okay. Haley, right you, here. I'm not asking. No, no, no. I'm not asking Anne because I know she'll out you in one second. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm not gonna. I would never do that. But, I mean, honestly, the two of us, we were up all night and we would just send them to each other. <laughs> it was so. <laughs> Okay, I have this really cute picture of these two babies sitting up in diapers, and they're looking at each other, and their hands are kind of like open, like they're having sort of a, a baby conversation. And I have the words in big blue, bold writing, how much did you cost? <laughs> That's a really tame one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you know what it was like you know when you're this and this is community and this is 
this is I I believe this is this is healing in community because you know when you're a little kid and then and then you're sharing with a friend something that you know your parents probably wouldn't like but you can't it's like when you first say the word fart or something and you can't stop laughing right and I feel like we get to be children we got to be children together doing this and 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 then we get to switch back to being grown-ups which is a an amazing thing to do when you're adopted because often the child part got kind of skipped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so feel that. I so identify with that. I feel like I was born and then I just had to be a little grown up. Okay. Can I share another meme then about that? Uh, Yes. Okay. So I have this little baby vacuuming the house (laughs) and um, it says for F's sake, I'll do it. (laughs) <laughs> and that's how I felt in my house with my with my parents like fine I'll do it I'll pull it together you know I'll be here to complete your life whatever you need I'll do it you know so it, it's this angry uh, baby vacuuming meme <laughs> with the f word in it <laughs> I really like that one. Oh, that's good those are Thanks. great I think maybe you should start an anonymous account <laughs> I thought of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. Okay. All right. Do you have any other thoughts on the creativity piece? Well, because I was thinking about what you said, Pam, about how at first I, when I was making the memes, I just I couldn't get enough of the fact that there was a picture and words. You know, it was like getting to write a children's book, but but I was getting to tap into two different parts of my brain, right? I was getting to choose a picture and then I was getting to choose the words. And I think if you look at all the guests that you've had, Haley, it's like in their own ways, they were playing with pictures, right? Like mm-hmm. even, even if it was Shannon, sh- she's, she's stitching words, but she's also stitching pictures. And I think that now when I'm doing memes, I'm, I'm pretty much dropping the picture because I have the confidence just to do the words. And then you have these people come onto your podcast and they've gone from creating to actually having to use language. Mm -hmm. And, and that is a real, that's a, that's a big step forward because that's where we want to be, right? We want to be at a place where we can speak our deepest thoughts and feel heard. And so at first, it's like a little kid, they start with Play-Doh or they start with drawings. And then, but as adoptees, because most people didn't really understand what we were going through, it didn't, we, our sense of language was stifled. I think it's a relief. It's, it's like putting forms of something unlived inside. Like the part of me that never got to live itself authentically because I was too busy being a traumatized infant and small child. And then I was too busy being used by my adoptive parents to complete their dream. I was like belonging to somebody else. So there was this whole voice and self that didn't have its right to full expression. So to, to start to find expression that doesn't necessarily follow rules or please people, but is actually honest and real is completely empowering. When I made my memes, I mean, I was laughing. I felt like my organs were laughing. It was so um, funny and it's such a relief to say what I wasn't supposed to say or allowed to say. And I almost felt like I was walking a little bit taller. <laughs> like, you know, I said it. I I spoke the truth. Mm-hmm. I created it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very sorry that I cannot post them online. I, my arm can be <laughs> twisted. As long as I don't get in too much trouble. I won't I won't get you in trouble. I, I do still have a compliance side after all. <laughs> Good adoptee. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we touched on was why do so many adoptees gravitate towards creative outlets? Okay. I think it's because we have so much authentic life living and hiding inside of us that it needs to come out somehow and being straight about it hasn't worked like society doesn't mirror our straight expression of ourselves and we have to go around the corner a bit 
And then I was also thinking that, I mean, sure, a lot of adoptees are just uh, smart, talented, artistic people who, but, but that's not really what you're asking. I, I just think we have a hidden life and our, the hidden life needs expression and we have to find a way to do it that feels real enough, but that's, it, it, it's sort of like outside of the box of relating to people. Like if, if we try to relate our truth to our birth families or adoptive families, we they often miss the mark with us. So when we create something, there's a satisfaction that won't be found in relationship. So I, I hadn't told my adoptive parents about the podcast, right, for like for a year. And then I told them I had a podcast. And then one day my mom kind of called out of nowhere and said, congratulations on season three. So I was like, whoa, okay, so maybe they're listening. And in our last visit, I said, are you like listening to some of them? And she's like, oh, yeah, I listened to a couple. Um, I got the gist of it. Wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thanks. That is, is <laughs> sorry, Mom, if you, if you listen to this, I guess maybe you are listening to more, but that is seared in my brain now. It's like you heard one, you heard them all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Ouch. I feel like I am having a... A hidden life and you're talking about that I was like this is <laughs> me expressing the hidden life and even when I do bring it and I say oh here it is this is like my life's work I got yeah. the gist of it <laughs> this is my heart and my soul and my brain and my talent and my my special voice I use and it's like ah eh. that was that was that was a fun conversation but you, good thing that, that the rest of us love you so much and that you're changing our lives and helping us so much. So <laughs> I know she's not my target audience. I get that. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> okay. Um, with this theme of healing through creativity, just the word healing can be a little bit controversial. In fact, at the uh, cub retreat that Ann and I were at in California, Someone asked the panel of therapists essentially that question, can we really be healed of adoption trauma? And, you know, one of the answers given was almost ex an example of, oh, yeah, well, I have all these different coping skills built in. And so, Pam, can you speak to that a bit? Because this is something that you wanted to get to today was coping skills versus healing and I really want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I really believe it's possible to heal and to do more than develop coping strategies. I mean, coping strategies are really important. And to me, they're just the container for the healing. I know that when I eat well and exercise and sleep well, maybe even meditate once in a while, I, I just, my whole system feels better, my nervous system, and that supports me to be able to, to heal. And healing, I think, is more about feeling different inside yourself um, in the world and feeling a sense of belonging to the world and having the freedom to bring toward us what we want and to keep away from us what we don't want and to really tap into joy, like the joy of being alive. So you might know one of my, my heroes is uh, Viktor Frankl, who was in the Holocaust, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. The original title of his book was Say Yes to Life. And so he wrote the book in 11 days right after he got out of the concentration camps for three years uh, where he'd lost almost everybody in his family. He found ways to tap into, I would say, the, the, the meaning of being alive, the joy of being alive through all kinds of, all kinds of ways. Even when he was starving and dying and trapped and had no possessions and lost his pregnant wife and everything else in the concentration camp. And I feel like I've healed a lot. And I, I wouldn't have said that maybe 10 years ago. But I think when people heal, they feel like there's a path back to that joy and that vitality and that saying yes to life. That's what healing feels like. It's more like um, the fabric of a person. It's not what a person does. Like maybe a, there can be people that have very healthy eating, exercise, meditation, yoga, therapy habits, but they feel miserable inside or they feel isolated or they feel 
um, hopeless or they hate themselves or they have negative talk going through their heads all day long. And that's not healing. That's just having, quote, healthy behavior. But healing is is finding an, a new way to relate to yourself and to the world where you feel like you're part of the whole dance of life, really. And that might, that's just too poetic. It's, it's, it sounds too uh, intangible. But I just know that when I have my bad moments, which of course I have them all the time, but when I have bad moments, I know there's a way through them to joy and to, to access to what I need. With having access to creativity, that's an avenue of expression and of connection that's really meaningful and has so much life in it. And to me, that's a very healing way of being in the world. Mm. And then we're not constantly cre creating, you're not constantly doing podcasts or whatever, but you have access to it. I, I would I would use that as an example, Haley. I would just say, you know, your podcasts are creative. You created this whole Adoptees On and it's touched so many lives. We don't even, you, we can't even count the lives it's touched. And then it's touched the lives of the lives it's touched, the friend, like the connections of the lives it's touched. So um, there's this whole exponential kind of touching lives that you've done. And you probably have difficult times with your kids or, you know, whatever difficult things happen. But this is this is alive and happening all the time in your life. Do, do you know what I mean? Are you going to make me cry on my phone? Are you crying? <laughs> that is so mean. I can't believe you would do that. <laughs> Wow. But so even even in your worst moment, you can know that, right? Mm -hmm. That that's happening, mm -hmm. and it, it's happened. It's real, and it's still happening. Mm. And you have more in you. So I think that that's a that's an aspect of healing. I love thinking about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's from all of us. <laughs> in the finale. So I was adopted at at the age of six months, and in my first six months, I was left alone in an apartment with by my birth mother uh, who worked full time. And I was, I'm sure, very hungry. And she was also physically abusive. And I was in two different foster homes. And then I was in a shelter and then finally adopted. And so by the time I was adopted, I was, um, I'm told by my, my grandparents told me that I didn't smile or cry or show any facial expression at all. I was basically frozen. And I have the feeling now, like when I, when I try to feel what that might've felt like, like that I pulled deep into my bones just to try to survive really. Something that I've said to you, Haley, before is that for me, moving toward healing has been a necessity. I think I would have died. I think I actually was, was close to death as a baby, as a newborn in this apartment. And I think that my body knows what dying or free and freezing feel like uh, so strongly. And so Healing is about filling out my whole physiological system, opening my eyes, inhabiting my eyes, and, and moving back into the flow of life and participating with life. It's, it's exactly what I see in the ride or die. I see, and I watch the people's bodies. People, mm -hmm. adoptees in particular, come in and they they are coping they got they got to this they're living their lives you know they drove their car but but it's like i watch their eyes and and their eyes don't they they move around a lot or they look mm -hmm. down and their bodies are stiff there it's it's a frozenness and th there's a moment in every class i've seen where when they realize that when they feel in their body, they feel the merit of their story or they feel the spark, their shoulders go back, the, the blood goes to their face and their eyes change. And it happens every time. I think that that's, that's the body, right? And I think that that's what I recognized in you, Pam, and that's why I wanted to work with you. It's like you have this vital force, mm -hmm. right? It's like if there's a if there's a pool, I'm pretty sure you're gonna jump in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I guess I guess what we're we're saying is that a person can have really good coping skills, but not be healing. They can be more surviving and coping. Mm -hmm. And healing is really people who are dying of I, I work I work so much with cancer. People who are dying of cancer can heal emotionally they can they can die on a happy note and i've seen it again and again people come back coming back to life even if they're in a in a dying process there was something that ann and i were talking about earlier today which is that 
in our brains, we, we have something called the default network. And the default network is, if you, I'm just, I picture it like a triangle, although I don't know what shape it actually is, but it's like the stories we tell ourselves about our lives and who we are that go around and around and around. And our brains have this negativity bias. So the stories in our default network are mostly negative stories. Like we wake up in the morning and our default network is going and we're thinking, um, I screwed up last night and, oh my gosh, I forgot to send in that check and uh, my, my daughter's pissed at me still and blah, 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 and you know everything wrong with us. And we can't heal in our default network. Our default network is like a closed system that just goes around and around and around. And so to heal, we have to shift into something called our direct experience network. And that's where something new can happen, where we're, we feel safe enough to let something new in. And that's really what therapy is all about. So when a client comes to therapy, if they're just in their default network, blah, 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 my mom, this, my dad, my husband, my kids, they're not going to walk out of the room any different. But if a therapist can help a client shift into their direct experience network, that's where they're in the moment. They're having a direct experience with one of their five senses. They're probably in their bodies to some extent. And something new can happen. That's where healing happens. For me, healing has been about doing some bold things to create opportunities for me to have direct experiences. Like I've done a lot of traveling and I've done a lot of humanitarian work where I'm encountering people who are also having other kinds of problems than I have. And I've thrown myself out of what's familiar to throw myself into direct experiences. And that's where I feel like I've gotten better. Yeah. And I had a similar experience where the healing came from two things was writing the, writing my, the book. And then that actually, what that did was that opened the wound, but, but it didn't, that was only part of the journey. What I had to do was come back and actually do the, the legwork, which was like, how am I going to survive in the world as an adoptee now? Like I, I feel physically and mentally challenged by, by coming out of the fog. I mean, I would have liked to go to to have gone to a sanitarium and just have someone take care of me for the rest of my life. Cause I, I was tired and confused. And I think that then to, to step up and say, okay, well, I'm going to start these ride or die classes because this is how I'll use the tools that I have, the creativity that I have to make a living and to, to help other people at the same time. I mean, isn't that what we're all doing? All three of us. I mean, we've, we've figured out what our creative skills are and we're trying to help the larger, well, community, but the adopt community in particular, because there aren't, there's just, there's not a lot of guidebooks out there or any really. I mean, there's books that will tell you how to suffer, but they don't really tell you how to go out and feel okay. Mm. I'm just I'm just reading um, Option B by Sheryl Sandberg. Have either of you read that? Yeah, I couldn't finish it. I didn't really like it. Okay, well, I'm not very far in, but she talks about this thing. So Option B is Cheryl's um, husband just suddenly passes away, and um, you know she's talking about how she's learned resilience, and so you know all of those things are kind of like very tempting to an adoptee to hear like, oh, tell me more about, you know, how can I survive from my grief that no one will acknowledge? Anyway, so in the first section, she talks about the three P's, personalization, pervasiveness, and permanence when we have a trauma. And so personalization, meaning it's all my fault. So adoptees are like, oh, it's all my fault I was given up for adoption, right? It's me. Pervasiveness, adoption affects every part of my life. And permanence, there's nothing I can do. And this is where, she didn't write these parts about the adoptee, I added that. But this is where I feel like so many of us are stuck. We're stuck here. And Mm -hmm. we're learning all those coping skills. And while we talk about healing, we're really just equating coping skills with healing. And so so I want to hear about... Mm -hmm moving forward, you you were talking about direct experiences, mm-hmm. and I want to hear all of those things. So one thing that comes to mind with the, the three Ps, um, I, I read the book, and I followed that story. And she, she actually 
I'm from the same area where she lives, um, Silicon Valley. So I was really interested in her story and her her recovery. So something I've learned is that when when we're bonded to our moms or our dads or each other, what makes a bond is a call and a response. So when babies are born, they call by crying and a good enough mom responds and can kind of be attuned and figure out, okay, is the baby hungry or does the baby need help going to sleep or is the baby need some stimulation or whatever. For us adoptees, our call and response probably got kind of screwed up with, first of all, being with a new mother and and then not being mirrored in our grief that we've actually lost our whole lineage and we're in unfamiliar territory. So there's this disruption in the call response and a disruption in the bonding. And um, in my case, I didn't really um, bond well with my adoptive mother. I just held her at arm's distance my whole life and her whole life. So I couldn't call to her because her response wasn't what I needed. And I think that we adoptees, we have a call that we're we're ringing out to the world, like help. You know, we we had a we had a bad time. The culture isn't mirroring it. Like the, we have disenfranchised grief. We have a traumatized brain. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to heal, and we need a response coming to us that actually fits us, that actually is attuned to what we actually are asking for in a given moment. So that goes back to the beginning of what Anne was saying about how this community is so special because that's what's happening so much on, on social media is people are calling and other adoptees are responding and they're saying, oh, that happened to me too, or oh, that's so painful, or that's so hurtful, or that's so heartless, or whatever it might be. And so being responded to with empathy and attunement is a very big part of healing. And that's where we have a lot of power in our community to do work together, like to to magnify the healing by doing work in, on a group level, like not just one-on-one -on -one trying to find a therapist who can you know, understand the magnitude of the trauma of adoption, but actually working in an intentional way together to optimize that we all can respond to each other's calls because we understand this territory together. And I think it's about, as a group, I, I think what I've noticed with myself and, and with other adoptees is it's really easy to get caught up in the story. You know, if you go to an adoptee conference, you'll find people telling the same story over and over again. And, and I did it. And it's like the old man in the sea and Hemingway's story where he told his story over and over again. And we do that because we're looking for some kind of sense of finality, but we can't figure it out. So we keep saying it. But the more we say it, it's like a straitjacket. We become our story and our brain spins trying to figure out like, what is my story? How can I tell my story? How can I? It's important to tell your story, but I think it's also important to, to realize that we are a body of energy. You know, we are a bunch of cells put together. If, if I took your body apart, there is no story in your body. But I actually thought my story was going to kill me. And, and so that's why it took me so long to write it. And when I was writing it, I thought it was going to kill me. But it's not in me. You know, it's a thing. It's a, it's an idea. And I think that what what I want to, to work with people, because now I see this, is your story, it's not something that you have to tell right. It's not something that you have to find all the details and get it right. You get to tell the story any way you want to tell the story. You get to own the story instead of the story owning you. And that's where the creativity comes in. And all of the guests on your, sh on your show this season told their story in different ways, different creative ways. And it, it frees you. So then you can go out in the world and say, okay, I'm a human being with a certain level of energy. And what do I want to do with this life? Right? It's not you, you deal with the story part. But then you can move on, which is mm -hmm. for me, it's such a relief. I don't have to think about my story anymore because I figured out how to tell it. And mm -hmm. it, it, and the way I figured out how to tell it was I'm, I'll just tell my story from my point of view because then no one can argue with me and tell me I'm wrong. But it took me a long time to figure really basic stuff like that out. 
I know that in, in individual therapy and also in group therapy, I try to find ways to hear the story or the essence of the story and then put it to the side and then see what else wants to happen because there's always more that wants to happen in the story. We all are imprisoned in our stories and they are hurting us, but we don't know what else to do and we want to make sure that they get their their fair weight of, of the, the, the truth that's in them. So today I had a client that came to my office who was in a story about her to-do list, that her to-do list is um, running the show in her life. So I got a big piece of paper and I sketched out this pretend to-do list with big boxes to check things off. And I, and I put it on this table and I gathered the clocks in the office and put the clocks with the to-do list. And I had her stand up in the room. And on the other side of the room, I put everything frivolous I could find. I put like these clay objects. I put this little funny plastic monkey thing, um, a stuffed bear, and I put that on the other side. And so I, I asked her to kind of be, you know, walking around trying to figure out what she wants to do with her to-do list because she says she wants to get out from under its control, but she says it's, you know, it's running her. She can't. When she, she picked up the to-do list and she was actually thinking about getting it out of the room, but then she realized that her to-do list was actually keeping her safe. And she had like a, an embodied experience, like a, a real experience of the fear she would feel without it. And so we're not done yet, but I had a, a relief like, okay, she just started to, to peek behind the story of the to-do list being so important and realizing that it's actually holding something together for her. But so, so she's still grabbing on the to-do list and she went home without, we didn't work it out yet, but she's closer than ever to not being run by her to-do list because I know that her, she's going to be thinking, whoa, you know, uh, there was more to this than I realized because she had an experience of it. And that really excites me. So I feel like there's ways that the creativity and therapy can can get around and under our our stories. There was a when I was training as an intern, we would use the the whole group to help a person move beyond their story. So if there was it was these were cancer groups. So let's say there was a man with stage four colon cancer, and he's he's got a story that he he always disappointed his mother, you know, and da da da. So somebody in the group would volunteer to be that story and they would stand behind him and say, you're such a disappointment. You've always disappointed me. And they would be the mother giving him the story out loud. And then he would say, Oh my God, my shoulders have so much tension. So then somebody else would stand up and put their hands on his shoulders and like provide some tension. And then he might feel something else, but we're trying to get these things out of the way. So something new can happen. And it's when something new can happen in our direct experience that's when we start to heal and just into, into becoming more of who we actually are. And we're not just trapped by these stories. And when you see other people around you doing the same thing, I think, cause it's in some ways it's terrifying to, to be an adoptee and to think, well, actually who would I be without my story? Cause it's, mm -hmm. it's maybe it's the only thing we've had our whole lives. And, and even if it makes us feel like prisoners, it's still ours, but you can look across the table and see, well, I see who you are without your story, right? You're this beautiful person. You're so much without your story. And then that gives you confidence that maybe you'd be okay without your story. I, I find that tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really believe in group healing and the power of group healing. It's a contagious, we have these mirror neurons, you know, 30% of our bodies of the neurons in our bodies are mirror neurons. So whatever's happening with you starts to happen with me and then it gets cooking. When groups are all about the story, people leave the groups feeling like exponentially worse. <laughs> you know, and that's like a bad day on Facebook where it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I can't believe that. Like trigger, trigger, trigger. But when things start to go well in a group and there's enough safety and people start taking risks to, to move beyond their stories, it becomes contagious and super powerful. And then the challenge is, how do we integrate it after the group is over? How do we go in back into our lives that are organized around our stories? And how do we start to actually translate the healing into our, our lives? But it's easier because now we know it. Now we know there's more. And also you have community. I mean, you and I have only met face to face twice, but it feels like, it feels like I've known you forever. Mm-hmm. And I, there's something about knowing, you know, when you work with people like Haley, even, you know, I've only 
met have I met you more than twice or just twice? Just it twice. Feels like, yeah, I mean, but see, I can't even keep track because you're so on my mind. I, I love this because I what your intention is to be the best Haley possible, and that makes me. It makes it easier for me to be the best and possible. It's just it's it's energetic group work, even from a distance. It's it's amazing. I am a hippie and I'm in Santa Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alright with that. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. It's okay. So um I love this idea that group healing, Pam, you said group healing, but before we started, I think group healing is magnified healing. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been facilitating groups since, gosh, like the mid 90s. My first experience with groups was after I got my master's in psychology, I, I was looking for a place where I wanted to have an internship. And I was really drawn to working with cancer, even though I had never had cancer and my family had never had cancer and no one I really knew had ever had cancer. But I know that it was now that it was because when people suddenly get a diagnosis of cancer, the rug is especially a bad diagnosis, like, you know, something that's incurable or a recurrence, the rug is pulled out under their feet. And they and everyone who knows and loves them, their lives are completely changed in that moment. And something resonates for me as an adoptee with that kind of trauma of this quick shift from one world to another, one life, one way of life to another. So I was really drawn to working with cancer because of that. And it was a place I could go and show up because of of my adoption trauma. I know that now. I was trained as an intern at this really wonderful, innovative cancer center. And we would work with groups of about 20 people and everybody had a very serious diagnosis. It was people with cancer and their either significant other or someone, a friend, someone important to them. And we would all get together for 10 weeks, um, one day a week, all day for 10 weeks. And it was my first experience of what a group could, could really do. There were ground rules like confidentiality. So we knew anything that was said was going to be kept private. And there were ground rules around not giving people advice and just letting people express themselves without any worry that they're going to have to deal with someone else's reaction to them. And then we had all these really creative and innovative ways of working with people. And what I saw in the group was people who were dying, like, like withering plants come back to life. It was like the group was water and sunshine to these plants. And even if they died and many of them, most of them did, they got their twinkle back in their eyes and they, they, we had a lot of joy in the groups and people just came to life. I came to life. And it was my first experience feeling like what a healthy family would feel like. To be an intern at this place, I had to, I had to participate for 10 weeks first and really experience it as a participant, even though I didn't have cancer. And then I was able to start facilitating the groups with the, with the main facilitators. But I felt like these people were like brothers and sisters and that the, the facilitators were like parents. And I felt like they had my back and I felt like I had everybody else's back and it was a we kind of a thing. And my, my life up to the, until that point had been an I kind of a thing. Like I felt on my own unless I was putting on a false front to try to survive and get through, but I wasn't really connecting from a deeper place. And this was the first place I started to connect from a deeper place. It, it felt like the kind of uh, internship or job that, that woke my heart up in a new way. And it was healing. It was healing to me. And then it, it let me know something about the power of groups. One thing I was thinking about this good family kind of model is that when we feel safe in a group, we know that no one's going to share anything personal we say. We know that no one's going to give us advice or indulge in like massive reactions to what we share. We have the space to start thawing or f- fluffing up our feathers or bringing deeper layers of ourselves forward. And this is really what we're talking about before with creativity, where creativity is bringing something of the hidden life forward. And when we're in a group that feels safe, we can bring parts of our hidden lives forward. And it's not always about pain and suffering and trauma. Sometimes it's about um, humor and joy and energy and vitality and dreams that are unexpressed and just space to be more of who we, we really are. I think of groups as being really empowering 
to the hidden life that wants to happen, not just to the, the pain and the trauma and the darkness that has, has happened already. And that's maybe one of the most exci- exciting parts. Something so wonderful for adoptees about being in a group is that we often don't see ourselves accurately. We have our trauma that we live with, and we have whatever stories we tell ourselves about why we were given up for adoption and why we don't fit in and why this and why that and everything wrong with us. And we have this traumatized brain that's just looking for problems to anticipate them and protect to protect ourselves, really. Um, so when we're in a safe group and we start to come forward with our hidden life, we start to be seen by people more accurately for who we really, really are and not for who we're pretending to be or passing as to be safe. And that is extremely empowering and exciting because people don't know how great they are. (laughs) You know, like Mm -hmm. people don't know how aspects of them are so unique and appreciated by other people. And so they get witnessed in a group for the fuller picture of who they are. And then the roles they play in their life can expand to more roles. Like, like I was always the, the rebellious, uh, angry adoptee. And so to start to be seen in groups for my goodness and my kindness was just sort of, it, 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 it changed my sense of myself like, oh, okay, I still am a rebel and I'm still angry, but I'm also really kind. I'm not just bad. I'm also good. <laughs> so that that's so powerful in a group. And that's where, that's where groups are like magnified healing because we don't just have a therapist who we're paying to, you know, it's easy to make up a story and say, oh, okay, if I finally found an adoption competent therapist and she's really nice to me and she doesn't argue with my level of trauma I'm describing to her, but I'm paying her. So what is it worth? Does it really matter? Is she, is she just, you know, am I paying her to be nice to me? But when you get in a group and you have all these people around you, people start to notice things and share how you're touching them and what, how you're impacting them. And then it's so much more believable to our whole nervous systems. We can kind of, it shakes up our sense of ourselves. We can go, wow, maybe I am funny. Maybe I am um, edgy. I had no idea. That's amazing. That just like is lighting my fire to get my support group started here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you hope for that with your support group for people to be to see each other and be seen in broader ways? Absolutely. And you're in the the Facebook group I have, the secret one for Patreon supporters and guests. And it's been incredible to see how people share these really intimate struggles that they're having and sharing their deepest parts of them, you know, just as you said, and then the others come and say, oh my goodness, me too. So that's like, that's an amazing level. And in the online communities, it's so cool that we can do that. Um, Mm -hmm. But the, like the in-person is just one more level. Right. Because our eyes are really receptors, you know, our eyes take in people's faces. And so when we have these faces in front of us that, that see us and aren't asking us to be different than for them, they're, they're just accepting us as we are. And then they're actually starting to, to love us, like to fall in love with us and to value us and to see things in us that we don't even really know. Our eyes drink that in and it changes us. Mm. Our eyes are such important portals. And you know, originally that's what gazing is with babies and infants is that infants are gazing at their mothers and their mothers are gazing at them. And ideally that's drinking in being loved and being wanted on this planet. But we don't all get that. (laughs) I didn't get that. My eyes at first didn't really want to, didn't really want to look. I didn't want to see what people were going to look like looking at me because I felt so ashamed of myself and to, to wake up my eyes and kind of bring them back to life and be able to look at people looking at me, seeing something good and not just, you know, what I'm ashamed about. Mm. That's really powerful. That does sound powerful. I think that safe and effective group work is worth a lot of uh, individual therapy. And I love individual therapy. I love going to individual therapy. I have a great therapist. Tell her about the dog. I heard a dog trainer say that when dogs are kind of neurotic, what helps them out is if they can walk off leash together in a pack 
and we've got these fields. I live in Davis, California. We've got these fields outside of town and we have two dogs and our daughter has one close by. So we'll get the three dogs together and we'll take them off leash on these, into these fields. And I always just think about that trainer saying, yeah, that kind of sets their minds straight or it heals them a bit in their, in the brain. And I think about us, we're, we're pack animals. You know, we're, we're pack animals too. We're, we're tribal animals. And for me, the thought of adoptees healing in a tribe is so exciting. Like, I just think I've been kind of just sneaking doing it in these other communities. Like I've gone to Esalen and I've gone to um, all kinds of workshops because I love them. But to, to actually have adoption be the center of it, like, wow, what could, what could happen there? So yes, ado- group healing is exponential or magnified healing. Well, think about what it feels like just in your body if you're, I mean, if you're, if you are an adopted person and you walk into an office of a therapist who, by some miracle, is an adoption competent therapist, it's going to feel incredible because you're going to feel safe. But, but you're also one person. Imagine if ten people walked into that room with an adoption competent therapist. It's like a life raft is sitting at the room. Because all of a sudden, I mean, one of the things about adoption, at least for me, is this feeling of aloneness, right? Like nobody really gets it. I, 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 this past year after writing the book and having people write to me and say that they, they could have written the book themselves, that's a shocking thing when I thought those, those thoughts had isolated me. And so just knowing that there's people out there that think the same way I do, this is what's made me so driven to have more of a healing community because that's what I feel is missing. It's this, okay, now we recognize that we're in this together, but what do we do next? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, we have, we've given ourselves permission to voice our pain, which is extreme. Healing, and I'm not, I'm not talking about coping skills, I'm talking about healing. Healing really requires going out of one's comfort zone. And it, of course, it takes, like I said, it takes safety to do that. But it it is really about taking a risk and having faith that there's something better for oneself than the, than the story that has become really comfortable, like a comfy coat. That we don't want to take it off because we don't want uh, to lose. That's the little bit we've got. Is is that? I mean, I've I've gone to groups before where I've thought. What if I didn't share that I was adopted? Like, what if I didn't bring my adoptee trauma in? Like, could people ever really know me? And I've ultimately thought, no, no, they really couldn't. But sometimes something else wants to heal or something specific wants to heal. And it it really takes uh, courage to step into healing and out of the story. It's hard. It's it is scary. I mean, it's I, I wrote about this in my book, so I don't think my daughter would be mad, but there's, you know, when she was a little kid, she used to suck her thumb, which is a habit. And then we went to the doctor and he said she needed to stop sucking her thumb because it was messing up her teeth. You know, she made it a day because I said, okay, you can have all the candy you want. Every time you want to suck your thumb, I'll just give you a piece of candy. And at one point, she, at the end of the day, she was just kind of sweaty and she looked at me and she, she was staring at my face. And uh, she said, mama. And I said, yeah. She said, can I suck on your nose? <laughs> <laughs> there's that that you know she's trying to grow up you, you know she's trying to change and be a big girl but it's really hard and when you do it in community I was there for her right so I let her suck on my nose which if you ever have a kid do that it is a weird feeling and, <laughs> but that, I mean it's a it's a strange example but that is healing in community because the next day she didn't do it Right. And then eventually she wasn't sucking her thumb. But if it was up to her, she would have sucked her thumb for a very, very long time because it's more comfortable. And even if you're an adoptee and you're living with your story and you're in an unhappy marriage and you're in a job you don't like and your stomach hurts all the time, it's still safe to you. And so it's Mm -hmm. scary to give up those things, even when they cause you pain. But what I what I found is anything that scares you, it is a doorway of flames that's worth wa- walking through. It is an invitation. So I don't I don't I used to avoid those doors, and now if something scares me, like writing the book or doing write or die, I I know that 
the fear. It's a, it's a, I mean, there's a fear of walking into traffic. That's a the kind of fear it's not worth doing, <laughs> but there, I have a sense of, okay, this is a, this is a fear I need to face. And at the other side, there's a world that I didn't even know existed. Mm-hmm. And so I have to sort of leap into the unknown and just have, make a game of it, have faith that I'm going to survive and that there's going to be something on the other side. But when you're doing that with other people, it's less scary because then you can commiserate. Yeah. You know, like Haley, I was, my practice got too full this year and I was seeing all these women who are widows and they had so much in common. And I felt like if I started a group for them, they could see each other twice a month in a group and they wouldn't need as much individual therapy and it would be a lot cheaper for them and they would have a community to to connect with. So we started that last February and these eight women are just delightful. They've bonded with each other. They understand what each other is going through. And I just facilitate a resilience group for them. And they're, they're, they remind me of adoptees because their life has changed suddenly and their main the main person they're bonded to has now died and They don't want to be in this new world, but they're forced to be in it. So, and their nervous systems are all screwed up. So we just had our final group of the year and we had this, we, we lit a barbecue, a fire in a barbecue and we, we burned these things that we wanted to let go of for 2017. And then we, we made these like, um, these art projects where we, we, we wrote down things we wanted to cultivate and bring in for the new year. But the joy in these women are, are incredible. And one of them just started to, to have knee problems. She's like close to 80. And these other women just showed up with walkers and canes and all these things for her. And it's like they have a community. So they're they're not needing to see me individually because they've got each other. And so it's it's just a much better situation for them. And they're healing so much more rapidly than they would if they were all in individual therapy with me. And saving money now, they can go to they can go travel together if they want. <laughs> <laughs> with their walkers, <laughs> yeah, with their walkers, no problem. Well, just just like you said, Anne, with people writing to you and saying your book is so similar to my life, like I I can't believe the emails I still get from people who just randomly happen upon the podcast. And they're like, these are the this is the first time I've ever hearing other adoptees voice these things. And we've just kept them stuck and silent for so long. I know. It's amazing. Because when, when you start talking about it, you just start, you forget that it wasn't always like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially now we live in adoptee land. It's kind of like, what do you mean? There's not, <laughs> what do you mean? You're, we're the first ones. You don't have <laughs> like all your friends that are adopted. <laughs> yeah. Okay, ladies, I want to hear about your retreat. What I, I wanted to create what, so I had this opportunity where this famous person gave me her house for three months so I could create my book. And it was like this nest and it was a miracle. And I was trying to think of how could I, so it took me three months to transform my life. And I was thinking, how can I give this to other people, but do it in a compacted way? And I thought, well, okay, number one, to make it go fast, you need a really good therapist right? Because this is, this is, this is hard stuff. And, and, and if you have focus and if you have support, this could go really, really well. And there's something about checking out of your normal life for a couple of days. I wanted the retreat to be more than two days, be more than three days. It's, it's a Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and then a Sunday morning. That's a significant amount of time. You, 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 your nervous system gets reset. You can you, for, you get to step out of your life for a while. You make these really good connections and Pam and I get to dive in deep and mm-hmm. with the writing and with the, the different therapeutic exercises that we'll do. It's, it's the thing that would have, if I couldn't have written the book and done it that way, I would have wanted to do it this way. This is like the super express train to how to, <laughs> to, to how to get really joyful. Well, you know, joyful is not even the right word. I can't say that I'm more myself since I wrote the book. It doesn't mean that I walk around laughing all the time. I mean, I'm still sad sometimes and I still feel confused, but I definitely feel a hundred percent more grounded in myself. And 
I think that the way Pam and I work together, there's we just understand each other and our thoughts. It's like we're feeding each other. And I wanted to share that with other people. And then I wanted these other people, I wanted these people that, that come to us and do this. They'll be their own group. This they'll be the they'll know each other forever for the rest of their lives mm-hmm. and, 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 and they can teach other people. And then, I mean, I, I hope, I hope this is the work I do for the rest of my life. I, mm-hmm. I feel like everything I did is to get here to, to help people free themselves. We only have this life, you know, I mean, maybe there's reincarnation, but let's just pretend that this is, this is the only one. <laughs> And it, you, you can blow it as an adoptee, you know, you can get so stuck that you die feeling like, wow, I never got to be myself. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, Haley, like you, I found you by some miracle and then I find Pam through you. And then I found all these people through your show. And I, I don't really believe in coincidence. You know, I think everything happens for a reason. And, and I think, Pam and I are really, really powerful together and we have so much to offer and I just want to share it and have people feel excited like that adoption for, for all of its difficulties, you might as well make it an opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're stuck with it. So let's see how great we can make it. I happen to really believe in our power to heal and there's that word heal again. Just like if I cut my finger uh, on a, you know, get a paper cut. I know my body's going to get to work right away and start healing my finger, even without me doing anything. And I think that for adoptees, given the right soil and given the right support, we can heal. And I think that what's been missing for us is the right soil and the right support. So I feel like I really trust that we want to heal. Like we want to get freed up to to live fuller lives and to connect more deeply and in a more satisfying way and to become more the creator of our own lives rather than just this object that was thrown around and bought and sold and treated so um well in my case unkindly and you know we want it we want to get back in charge of having our life be like a palette where we get to decide what we put in it and um, live the best life we can possibly live, whatever that means to each person. So I believe in our ability to do this. And in some ways, working with people with terrible diagnoses or becoming paralyzed in accidents or losing vital people like like we all have too, seeing people heal has really shown me, like my body knows we all can heal. If, if we're given the right soil and help, we all can heal. And I, I know this. Mm-hmm. So I want this retreat to be amazing soil with amazing quality help. And I trust the process. I trust we, we, we get there and we do the right things in the right ways. We're going to just naturally heal together and bond. Seems inevitable. Yeah. Plus it's in Berkeley, which is so beautiful. <laughs> I love Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. So the retreat is going to be in Berkeley, California, up in the North Hills, which is a beautiful area of Berkeley, right near this place called the Gourmet Ghetto, where you can walk down and get all kinds of amazing food. But we picked a giant house that has a view, and there's some rooms for rent in the house, or there's like uh, Airbnbs or bed and breakfasts nearby in the neighborhood. We're going to meet for four days. We're going to have eight healing sessions. Each session will be three hours. So we're going to have eight times three hours <laughs> together. <laughs> and then we're also going to have rest time and, you know, take a walk, go explore Berkeley, get some sleep, whatever, you know, to, to time off as well, because people need time to integrate and just, you know, not just be with people all the time there. I think there's some, um, there's some introverts coming who um, are going to have their own rooms and, you know, just have a place they can just go retreat and get away from people if they need to break, you know. Um, and we're going to be working in all kinds of ways with people. We're going to be using art. We're going to be using writing. We're going to be doing a lot of being together and I'll be facilitating, um, ways of, uh, interacting and teasing out this, you know, what wants to come alive versus what's blocking you from coming alive. And I think that the fact that we're all going to be adoptees is going to be just amazing because Mm -hmm. there's so much we won't need to explain to each other. And Mm -hmm. That's just going to take so many layers out of the way <laughs> of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. getting close and connecting. 
the cost is $625 for the retreat. And then people book their lodging either with us in the house or nearby and pay for their food on their own. We have, I think we have six people who are signed up and others who are considering it and thinking about it. I think we have three or four people flying in from other places. We're really excited about it. We have a couple of young guys coming and college age. So that's going to be an interesting mix of men and women, younger and older. And we just expect it to be a really nurturing and transformative experience. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's President's Day weekend in in the United States. So February 15th to 18th. People can either... I, it's going to end at one o'clock on Sunday, the the 18th, and then people in the United States won't have work the next day. So it's time then to either get home or have a day to just rest or integrate. We're going to come kidnap you, Haley. So have fun being there. <laughs> <laughs> if we're not able to come to your retreat, um, say we live in England, for example, um, <laughs> Or New Zealand, my New Zealand listeners want to come too, I've heard. Is there an activity that you might be doing at the retreat that you could recommend to us to maybe do at our next support group meeting? I thought, I thought of something right off the bat. I think, you know, there's there could be that someone could be listening right now and feeling discouraged that if they don't have enough money or they don't have enough time and feeling left out. Um, like right off the bat, you could write the three reasons why you can't go to this retreat. And those things, those three things will seem like problems. But what if those three things are, what if they're wonderful things? Like what if those are, those three things are you? So it might be the three reasons are I don't have enough money. Um, I don't actually like Berkeley. I swore I'd never go there again. Hmm. And the third one is no one's going to take care of my dog. Well, you have three things to write about. And the first is um, I don't have enough money. So tell the story, write the story, write two pages of not having enough money. And it's not a pity party of not having enough money. It's what is it like to not have enough money? And you treat it with seriousness and beauty, right? You, it's like, it's like you make a little movie out of it. And it's not that saying, oh, I wish I had more money. It's just what does it look like when you don't have enough money? Or if you say, I have to take care of my dog. Well, write about your dog for, for, two, for two pages. It sounds really, really simple, but I think anything that gives you access to writing about your life in a way that's with careful attention is a form of prayer and that's a form of escape from pain well i definitely have fomo fear of missing out so (laughs) can i can i add something to what she said yeah we have a lot of opportunities now to find people online who we connect with and i would just encourage adoptees to find people that they feel very understood when they share something important to them. Like people who respond to them in a, when when people respond to you in a way where you feel like, oh, they really got the essence of what I was trying to say, that's a good connection. And when you start to feel like you can move in the relationship, you can be serious, you could be joyful, you could be funny, you can play. All those things are, are indicators of a good quality relationship. And so I think that we adoptees need to find as many people as we can. And who is better for us than other adoptees who understand the heart of the trauma, like the heart of the beginning of our lives. And so to have room to move in safe relationships that are, have many aspects to them is, is a wonderful thing. Even making subgroups. I mean, we talk, there was some talk about, you know, the cool table and the not cool table recently on some posting, but it's not about clicks. We should really be careful not to form clicks we, because we all are so sensitive to rejection. But trying to find people that just really resonate with us and where we feel good about ourselves, where we feel more like our best selves with them. And that's what, one thing I found with Anne is when we talk, whether it's about a problem or about something good, I feel more of a sense of my best self with her. And it's unique because she understands the pain that I understand. So it's, it's great in that way. For me, it's healthy for me to, to go to her, to call her and be responded to if I need help. So 
that's that's maybe something I would say is find the right people. Yeah, and Haley, as far as the fear of missing out, I was thinking about you know Pam when you were talking about how there was the mirror and neurons, and then we're all connected. You you know Haley, it's like we we are as adoptees, we are all connected. And so if one group is doing something, I think it influences everybody. Yes. And yeah, so, it's like the ecosystem. Right, right. We're one huge group. Yeah, and it's, a, and the, it's and that, an amazing thing. That goes back to the beginning of this podcast of us talking about how the creative episodes have influenced us right. because they, they have. So what what each of us is doing is is – affecting each other exactly their successes are are also my success because that they're i know that they could do that that means i could do it even it doesn't yes. mean i'm going to be a, in, a beautiful singer but in some in some way uh, it's possible just even right, knowing, like more is more right more is more yeah like that especially with cake <laughs> <laughs> and connection in our case adopting oh, yeah. connection oh yeah yeah I forgot to stop thinking about food. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I was thinking about your question, Haley, is that um, I'll tell you about a really neat thing I've done with my women's groups this year. I have I have three groups in my private practice, and they're all with people who have some kind of major loss. What we've done is we've made bridges where they pick two points, either in the room or even outside, and one one side of the bridge is the feeling of being constricted and afraid and feeling awful, kind of like how we adoptees feel like on our worst days, like we just want to go hide in a hole or worse, just not even be here. And then crossing the bridge, there's a threshold in the, in the middle somewhere. And then the other side is where we feel more expansive and more connected and we're in, we feel part of the world. And we're not just into, into conserving for our own well being, like, uh, we're, we're really wanting to, we're, we're more in touch with our generosity and wanting to share with others. And that's the, when we feel the best, that's how we are. Uh, we humans. I've had people make their own bridges. They've done it on paper and then they've done a walking back and forth between these two sides. And it's really walking between trauma and not trauma. And we all have those in us. We have the trauma and we have the not trauma. When we walk over to feel what the trauma feels like and we feel constricted and tight, our muscles are tight, and we're, our eyes are looking down, and we don't want to be there, and we maybe have some painful, and just as we feel pain or whatever, then walking to where we feel expanded, expansive, and we see what, we see the colors around us, and we see the world beyond us, and we know we're part of it, and we have something to share, maybe. Once people start realizing that's a bridge that we live on all the time, two hours ago, I might have been on the constricted side of the bridge, and then now I'm on the the more expansive and connected side of the bridge, but we need to get to know our bridges because this is really how we heal. Because when we're on that expansive side of the bridge, that's how we want to feel. I mean, that's how, that's what Viktor Frankl was doing in the concentration camps is he was like, um, he knew he could go take a nap when he was exhausted and feeling awful, but he might go, he was a doctor, so he might go and do some medical treatment on somebody to help them out. And that was a more expansive, connected thing, connected thing to do. And he knew that that mattered. It was meaningful to people and he felt better inside and he had that power to make that choice. So anyway, getting to know this bridge is really important to me. And it's important to me to help people that I work with one way or another, get to know this bridge. So that's something that you could do together. And then you sort of talk through yeah. the experience of being on one side or the other or how it feels to be choosing your side or yeah I mean in, in a way it's really what a trigger is like we're we might be doing just fine and then suddenly we get triggered by something and we're boom we're on the other side of the bridge and we feel awful and it can really feel like we don't have access to anything but that terrible side of the bridge and we don't want to expand you know we don't want to connect we just want to say F you world, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be here. And, and it can take, it can take a long time sometimes to get out of that. That's what being triggered really is. It's like landing on the other side of the bridge and it's, it's horrible. So, I mean, that's just a metaphor for how to work with it, but it's really the thing that I think we, that to me is what healing is, is like knowing that there's a bridge and knowing how to put one foot in front of the other and get back across it and getting more and more familiar with the path so that it's not, it doesn't take so long. Mm. It might start to take 30 minutes instead of uh, three months, 
well, when I was talking to um, Nicole, the art therapist in uh, one of the episodes in season three, she was talking about drawing a bridge and what's on each side. And um, she gave a really great exercise. So if you want to go back and listen to that, that would be something that people could do on their own. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about what is different about a retreat, like a small intimate retreat like this with two of you leading versus a conference situation where you're going to different lectures and workshops and even some, they have a theme of healing, but um, it seems like that's an unfulfilled promise. (laughs) You get to the end of the weekend and there's, you know, it's an unfulfilled promise. (laughs) I can address that. (laughs) There's something about when you go into a conference, for me, I feel very, very exposed because there are a lot of other people who are also feeling really exposed, but there isn't one common, well, we're all there I mean, why do people go to adoptee conferences? They go there to connect and learn. But it's very loose. And I think when you go to a, a retreat, you have you 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 inherently have a weighted blanket over you because this is something you're doing for yourself. You you don't have to take care of yourself in the same way. It's like you're sitting in a comfortable chair and you get to sit back because Pam and I are running the show. When I went to um, a, a writing retreat with about 10 people, it just felt so different decadent. And I felt like I was doing this for me. One of the key differences is that I can't speak to every retreat, but I've had really good retreat experiences, both as an attendee and as a person facilitating retreats. But to me, retreats are safe places to explore new territory within and to open up new doors. And to me, when I go to, when I go to conferences, I'm more in learning mode and I have I have a guard up because I I might see someone I'm scared of or I might have a bad interaction. There isn't like a safety it's it's so big there's not like a safety nest built in. So retreats to me are safe and intimate and they're places to to go deeper inside and to heal. Like I know with my license I have to go get a certain amount of educational units and I used to go to conferences to get those units so I could learn about this and that. But now I go to places where I can experience something in an intimate, safe setting so that I can grow while I'm getting my units. Retreats are like therapy. And conferences are like education and networking. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I I definitely feel like after a conference, I have to do a whole lot of self-care. Where after a retreat, a retreat is the self-care. I mean, the thing that people might have to recover from after a retreat is growing because we, when we grow beyond the ways our lives are organized, that's a bit stressful because we have to then figure out how are we going to make room for this new thing in our current lives. But that's growing. Right. It's like molting, how snakes, snakes molt. Hmm. Right. Well, I, I love what you talked about earlier, Pam, about the experiences and how that changes you. And just the experiential nature of a retreat and all the different um, hands-on activities and Mm -hmm. things that I imagine that you're planning. Yeah. I mean, my hope is that people are mostly in their direct experience network where they're mostly directly experiencing the nourishment of the view and the, the safety of kind responses if they, when they share something and, and the direct experiences that that Anne and I bring to the retreat itself and delicious coffee or tea or whatever. I, um, I love the air in Berkeley. It's like wonderful air. I, and that, that's all direct experience. And I, I, I wouldn't want people to have much of a chance to get too far into their default networks because that's just not what it's about. That's just, that's just fortifying the old fortress of pain. Well, it's also like a nurturing river. It's not, we're not just throw. you're not just being thrown into an ocean and say, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, it's, it, we, we would be setting up a whole structure for safety at the beginning, you know, from confidentiality to how we talk to each other at the retreat. I'm, I'm pretty strict about that stuff because I, I know what 
what stuff makes us feel safe and what doesn't in a group. People need space to share without having to worry that they're going to get, you know, uh, disagreed with or advised or any of that stuff. We don't do any of that. That's not helpful to growing. Oh, I have a little, I have a little anecdote, um, which is that I sent a, I sent a copy of the write-up to Nancy Verrier because she was my adoptive mom's therapist for 15 years and she lives right there near Berkeley. So this is like right near her community and she's turning 80 this year and um, is mostly doing phone work now and still some, some conferences and things. But she was saying she loved the title because she's really been focusing on moving forward into healing too herself. Like she, like that, like, what we're what we're offering is also, she said, fitting with the way she's approaching her work these days, which is more about healing um, and less about just kind of the important, the very important part of taking inventory of just how bewildering and upsetting this entire <laughs> thing is. <laughs> Speaking for myself, you know, it's important that we get our bearings around how hard this has been, but also, and then what do we do? Which is essentially what Haley's been doing with this whole third season, right? Like first. Yeah. Two seasons, you're telling the stories, and now you're kicking into creativity. Yep. It's a beautiful thing. It's something we've talked about before briefly about spiritual bypass. Just that very thing you just said, Pam, about, you know, recognizing it and acknowledging it, and then you can do the healing. Exactly. It's really about being grounded in the, the gravity of this whole institution and how it's impacted people who are hurting from from their experiences of being adopted without minimizing anything. And then it's the, then what, then what do we do? How do we let our traumatized systems, whether it's way, ways we've been calling to the wrong places, calling to addictions, calling to people who aren't really there for us. And how do we start calling for the right things and getting responded to the right ways so that our lives can become better mm-hmm. and we can heal. My life is definitely a million percent better with you two in there, that's for sure. <laughs> I feel that way too. <laughs> you guys make sense to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to put it. oh, it's so good to speak the same language. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> My nervous system's happy right now. Yeah. <laughs> I can laugh. <laughs> Well, it has been so lovely to talk to you ladies, and I so appreciate all the different pieces of wisdom and amazing insights that I got from you. Can you tell us again, where can we find the information for the retreat and where can we connect with you online? The Facebook group for the retreat is called Beyond Adoption, Colin You. I can be reached um, on my Facebook page at Anne Heffron or my email is Heffron at gmail.com. Yeah, the best way to reach me is through my email, which is pcordano at comcast.net. That's P-C-O-R-D-A-N-O at comcast.net. Remember, we're kidnapping you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love you girls so much. So fun to chat with you. Did you know I have a monthly newsletter? It's new, sort of. There's only been two so far, and I'm sending my next one in about a week. It's a place for me to share my personal thoughts with you, and also any behind-the-scenes news of the show, like what's coming up for season four for the theme and dates of the launch, all that good stuff. If you'd like to be among the first to be in the know, you can sign up on adoptizon.com slash newsletter. If you are passionate about helping adoptees and want to move our voices forward, come and partner with me. Adoptizon.com slash partner has all the details. I've had this goal for 50 patrons for a while, and it would be so amazing to hit that before I launch season four. So if you've been on the fence or you've thought about supporting the show, but just haven't pulled the trigger yet, it would mean so much to me. I take monthly pledges that help pay for the cost of hosting and producing the show for you. And I have some great thank you gifts for you, including a secret Facebook group. There's even some unedited episodes of the show. If you need something to tide you over, until season four. So that's adoptizon.com slash partner.
this is the season three finale. What does that mean? When will the show be back? I'm going to take a brief break, friends, and I'm going to be starting to record season four. And you'll likely see a few healing episodes in your feed here and there just before season four gets going. So make sure you're subscribed in your favorite podcast app and you won't miss an episode. But I will miss talking to you every week. So I can't wait until season four starts up again. I just love you listeners. I love connecting with you on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter is my favorite. Um, But I am active on all of those social media platforms. So you can come find me at Haley Radke and also at adoptees on. So I look forward to chatting with you on social and during the break and make sure you subscribe to the newsletter so that you will know when the date is of our launch. Thank you for listening. Let's talk again soon. There's my dogs again. Someone just rang the doorbell. (laughs) (laughs) Probably someone selling encyclopedias. <laughs> do they still do that? Hopefully no. it's someone selling chocolate.